If your mainly just picked up the mail and drove it around, that would be very useful. Similarly, if hemoglobin just picked up oxygen and transported it around your body without letting go, that wouldn't be very useful either. Instead, hemoglobin needs to be able to pick up the oxygen in your lungs where there's a high concentration of it and then release it in your toes where there's a lower concentration of it. And we need ways to kind of tell the hemoglobin where to release it. And there are different ways in which we can regulate the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen in addition to kind of just the natural cooperativity you have of the oxygen binding. One of the ways that we can do this is with this molecule 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 2,3-disphosphoglycerate, um, you might see it sometimes called, typically abbreviated 2,3-BPG. It is produced in erythrocytes, red blood cells, in an offset shoot of glycolysis. It binds to the central channel that is going to be open in the form that is the unbound form, this T form, but it's not accessible in the form, the R form, that's the oxygen bound form of hemoglobin. So they can't, if BPB binds, now you're in this low affinity state for the oxygen. So you're less likely to pick it back up if you were to drop it. Therefore, the binding of the hemoglobin is going to stabilize that T state decrease the affinity for oxygen and shift the curve to the right, meaning that we need more oxygen in order to have the same amount of hemoglobin bound to, bound to oxygen. Another key thing about 2,3-BPG is that fetal hemoglobin has a lower affinity for it than does the adult hemoglobin, and therefore it's going to be less affected by the BPG. You get a smaller shift when you add BPG to the fetal hemoglobin versus when you add it to the adult hemoglobin. This makes it so that in under the same conditions, the fetal hemoglobin is going to have a higher affinity than the adult hemoglobin, which is going to allow it to take the oxygen it needs from the low availability of oxygen that it encounters in the blood that it's seeing. So if you think about the oxygen levels that the fetus is encountering, we have our fetal arterial blood here and our fetal venous blood here. Not that big of a difference, especially when you compare the kind of your lungs to your adult venous blood. There you have this huge shift, whereas here you only have this, this small shift in the oxygen concentrations. So we need to shift our curve accordingly to have it so that the steep region of the curve is in the area of the concentrations at which we're actually going to be encountering, or the fetus is actually going to be encountering. And so if we compare the difference that we would have if our fetal hemoglobin at the arterial blood versus the venous blood, we see that we get this big shift, this big offloading. But if we look at the concentrations of the adult hemoglobin, um, if we look at like what it would do, at these oxygen concentrations? Well, these oxygen concentrations here, it's only like going to be 0.25 or whatever, like only a quarter of it is actually going to be, is actually going to be bound to the oxygen, as opposed to if we look at our fetal hemoglobin, here we're up to like half of it is bound in this arterial blood. And then if you look down at your venous blood, you've released it. And so if you looked at the adult, though, you would only be releasing basically um, like a quarter of the potential hemoglobin ox sites that were available. So by shifting the curve to the left, we're shifting the steep part of the curve into that region that is actually going to be encountered in the fetal tissue. And in this way, the fetus is able to both grab onto oxygen and, re and release it even though there's not that much oxygen available. So we need to have that higher affinity to begin with and shift the curve region into the, into the kind of region that's actually going to be applicable. And although we are kind of raising the affinity, you have to remember too that there's less oxygen around. And so you're still in this zone where you have about, um, about like 25% or whatever of the oxygen sites filled. So you're going to be in this range where your hemoglobin is able to kind of like bind and unbind the oxygen, and therefore it's able to deliver it throughout the fetus as needed. Um, even though there's a low amount of oxygen around, it has enough affinity to pick it up, but also there's a, not enough of it so that if it drops it, it would quickly pick it back up. And therefore you're able to kind of have have the fetus get all the oxygen it needs, despite it kind of like already being used up by the mom.
Another key thing about 2.3 BPG is that its production is upregulated, so there's more of it made at high altitudes. And this is important because there is less oxygen available at high altitudes. So it might seem a little counterintuitive that you're going to kind of decrease your affinity for oxygen when there's in places where there isn't very much oxygen. But that's because you have to kind of think about the shape of the hemoglobin curve. Typically with hemoglobin curves, you're often comparing two th places. And so you're comparing like, okay, well, I've got the oxygen in my lungs versus that in my tissues. And that's going to tell me how much am I actually releasing. If we were to look and go and look at the amount that we would be releasing, if we didn't have, if we only had a low concentration of BPG, well, what would happen is that in our lungs, we'd be starting with less, but then we'd be released, we'd be getting to the same point in our tissues. And so we'd be releasing less. We'd be releasing less than if we had started with our, in our, the high, the pressure of oxygen. So the concentration of oxygen that you see at sea level. So there you would get 38% versus here, you would only get 30%. But if you increase the BPG, well, now you're going to shift things right. And if you shift things right, yeah, you're going to decrease. So you're picking up a little less in your lungs. You're a little less saturated in your lungs. But then because the, the curve is still kind of um, like flattish up here, but then when you get to this kind of big drop, well, now you're shifting the position of the big drop. And so you end up having a big change, a big difference between um, the different concentrations of BPG at this lower concentration of oxygen, at the concentration of oxygen that you find in the tissues. So the concentration of oxygen that's found in the tissues isn't changing. It's the concentration that the lungs are exposed to that's changing in the when you think about sea level versus high altitude. So at high altitude, you're going to have less available in your lungs. So you're starting with less. You're starting with a little, even less of that um, is going to actually be bound to hemoglobin if you have the 2,3 BPG, if you have more of the 2,3 BPG. But that's a small kind of decrease compared to the decrease um, that you're going to see in your tissues, the decrease of affinity, that is not the decrease in like the oxygen concentrations. You're getting to the same oxygen concentration, but now you have a lower affinity. And so you're going to be offloading more. And so in this way, the BPG is able to kind of compensate. So you have a little less here, but you have a lot more here. And so you're going to overall be releasing a lot more oxygen, delivering a lot more oxygen than if you had this condition where you were starting here, but without as much BPG. And there, in that case, you're only getting this 30% versus the 37% you get with the higher concentration of BPG. So the main things about R2,3 BPG, it's made from an offshoot of glycolysis. It binds to the central channel that's only available in the T state, so the um, non-oxygen bound form, as opposed to the R state, the relaxed the form, the form that is actually going to be um, bound to oxygen. So binding of the 2,3 BPG to that central channel is going to make it so that the ox that the hemoglobin is going to be stabilized in that T state, that oxygen offloaded state. And it's going to be harder for it to um, pick up the oxygen. Whether or not it picks up oxygen is then going to kind of depend on how much oxygen is around as well, which is why you can still have like, if you, if, even if you had like similar levels of 2,3 BPG, you could have the, the, the amount that's of oxygen that's actually present is going to make a difference. 2,3 BPG is binding in that central channel to between the beta subunits or between in fetal hemoglobin, those would be your gamma subunits. And in the gamma subunits, you don't have as many favorable salt bridges that can form. And so fetal hemoglobin is going to have a lower affinity for that 2,3 BPG. As a result, it's going to be less affected by the 2,3 BPG. And it, therefore, um, you're going to basically get a left shift if you were to compare it to the adult. But really, that kind of like left shift is just an artifact of it just being less of a shift to the right. Because 2,3 BBG would shift it to the right. And so you're not shifting to the right as much. And so you're going to be um, have a higher affinity in the presence of BBG. You'd have a higher affinity of the fetal one than the adult one which is good because what's going to happen is that the, the fetus is going to be exposed to a lower concentration of oxygen than the adult hemoglobin is. But you can imagine that we've been talking about how that 2,3 BPG affecting the hemoglobin was important for the adult hemoglobin in order to offload the 
oxygen to your tissues. And so the adult hemoglobin basically comes into play at birth. A little after birth, you start making the beta chain and um, not making the gamma chain. So the gamma is the one that the fetal hemoglobin has instead of the beta. And so they kind of swap roles after so, um, um, a few weeks, several weeks after birth. And so if pe if babies have mutations in like sickle cell anemia or something that's affecting the beta globin, they might not even show up for um, for several weeks because the beta globin doesn't come into play yet. But there are actually techniques that are like treatments for sickle cell and things that actually do increase the expression of the fetal hemoglobin in order to help compensate.